on Kingston Springs Regional Planning Commission for November 12, 2020. I'm going to have a roll call of the voting members. Keith Allgood? Present. Tony Campbell? Absent. Tom Collins? Here. Tony Gross? Here. Brian McKay? Here. Mike Patton, that's me. Here. Glenn? Here. Here. Chuck Slayer? Here. Bob Stolen? Here. Uh, not voting staff, Sharon Armstrong? Here. John Lawless? Here. Uh, Martha Brooke? Here. And Brittany Sam. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. And um, uh, you have the minutes from the October 8th meeting before you. Do you have a motion to approve it? So moved. Okay, we have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the minutes are approved. You have the uh, meeting agenda before you. John, are there any changes to this agenda? No, sir. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay, we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so the agenda is approved. So, uh, item six, old business, there is none. Moving on to new business. Item A, discussion on mixed use overlay district, the downtown Kingston Springs area. Um, is that you, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Good evening, Planning Commission. If you look behind you, there's a map that's been generated on the wall. Um, and with the Chair's permission, I will approach um, the map. The area, we talked to you last month about bringing you a mixed use overlay for the downtown district that would be platform on conditional use only. Every development project within the zone of the Planning Commission so that you can determine whether or not the use for that particular lot is consistent with your goals as a planning commission and fits the use of the land. So the area that we're looking at is outlined in yellow on the map. Um, and what brought this to light for us, as we explained briefly last month, is we get a number of requests for uses from property owners that simply are not within the zoning book at all. As an example, we have a young couple that bought a house adjacent to downtown. It's literally less than a block behind the filling station. He would like to put a studio in his yard where he can serve one or two clients at a time. Our home occupation uses will not allow him to do that. So what we're asking to do is create a mixed-use district that's contained in your packet Mixed use district allowed uses and form based. And the difference between this and standard zoning standard zoning is a grid based use that has a prescribed number of permitted uses in a list. And then there's generally a list of uses that are permitted by special exception. Um, that's it. Then D part of that ordinance will say if it's not in one list or the other list, it's prohibited. So that's known as grid-based or nuclear zoning design. This is a form-based district, which means you propose to do something, you bring that use to the planning commission, the planning commission and the staff will be a lot, the infrastructure, whether or not we have adequate services to serve that particular use, you will make a determination that it won't be a, a deterrent or nuisance to surrounding property owners or neighbors. You will look to see if there are any other prohibitive factors that affect that use. That's called form-based code. And it's done by the Planning Commission as a permitted use on a case-by-case -case basis. As we look at downtown, there are a number of lots that are simply too small to accommodate an accessory use or any other use because they're an eight, eight tenths of an acre or they're eight one hundredths of an acre. They're just too small to accommodate any other use. But that's not the case for all of the lots. And the, if code has taught us anything um, in this culture, it's taught us that we are now pushed to work from home. And in many cases, there is an adequate space within someone's house to do that, or they have an ongoing business that they don't want to lose, but they can't go to downtown Nashville to carry on that activity. 
So this body will decide what is appropriate for the size of that particular structure of the V, whether it's attached, detached, and how that's platformed on a use-by-use -use basis. It's the most consistent and thorough examination of a lot of RAM to assign and determine whether or not a use is tolerable. You would look at things like traffic, parking, signage, all of those things that your customers would look at. In addition to that, it would allow residential occupation. Um, I think the old saying back in the day was live above the store. And we don't have a lot of two-story buildings in downtown Kingston Springs, but in the future that may change. So if there are models present in the county that this would replicate, um, I think the village in Pleasant View, even in downtown National City, there's residential occupation above the businesses on the downtown grid. The secondary function of Corn Base in downtown is to attract people to your downtown core to support your businesses, your stores, your boutiques, and your activities. So when you don't allow that occupation on a second or a third floor, or limited to three floors because of fire suppression in Kings and Springs, it kind of forces people to live outward from the city, and then it, your downtown doesn't thrive as well as it could. So we have brought this ordinance to you. The model is one that's been used um, all over the country. It's actually been recommended by APA as a one based model for this type of development. So tonight I'm looking for feedback and your thoughts and ideas on it. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask each of you kind of have, have all of you had a chance to at least look at it in the packet? So if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to start on this side of the room and just ask everybody what their thoughts are for this type of thing. It's, it's meant to encourage activity downtown where traffic is already present and where there could be a blend of uses uh, for people to have. Mr. Brimmett, your thoughts? I, I, I like the idea of preserving what we do have and uh, also limiting growth somewhat. Um, so I, I um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot to go with the moment too, so yes. And I think as we think about the downtown area and the greatest outline on that particular map in front of you, not every lot is appropriate for a mixed use because of size or parking restrictions or proximity to a state highway. There's a number of restricting factors that occur on some lots, but there are lots downtown where the use would be appropriate. Mayor Gross, your thoughts? It's actually what we've discussed it before. I think it's a great idea. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of changes in the way people are kind of operating, like you said, with COVID and so on, but also with just the economy as it is and multi-generational use of homes and such things like that. And uh, I think it's a really great thing. Also, the way we work is so much different, uh, you know, with remote workplaces and so on. So I think it's a, it's a good idea to open up these kind of opportunities to people. And also, as a conditional use permit, if you find that a use is appropriate for the lot, but there are some restrictors that you think, as an example, the young man that asked about a recording studio, I think an appropriate condition for the approval would be that it's soundproof to the extent that you're not disturbing your, your adjacent neighbors with noise. So that's just one example of how a conditional use permit is reviewed. Um, in its context, and, and as always, staff will contribute to uh, staff report on each application. Not to mention, people do this anyway. They do. And this we we have a number of uses that place us in a position, and that's not to say that we're trying to legitimize uses that we're not permitted or not. But it places us in a position of, if you tell someone, if someone complains, and you tell someone you can't do that, and it places us in a position of enforcement and legal action and cost to that property owner and cost to the city. There are some uses that are just not appropriate. Industrial uses, heavy metal uses, uses that have toxic chemicals, and there are just some that are just not. Uh, uses where you park very large vehicles, you have traffic circulation, again, not appropriate. But this gives you the flexibility to examine it and determine the appropriateness of the use. Chairman Patman. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I like that idea. And, you know, the 
to emphasize what you just said. Um, it's one thing if you don't want a certain use and somebody's not doing it, we don't want to legitimize that. But if things are going in a direction that makes sense, um, trying to capture that so we can keep going in that direction and not deter what we want to happen anyway. So that makes sense to me too. I, I, I got lost a little bit trying to understand like the colors and everything and what each one meant. And I got, saw the answer key in here. But, um, so at some point, I, I want to get all that. But yes, it makes sense to me because I, I want the downtown to keep moving in the direction that, that we like to care for the kids as players. We steered away from in our discussions about this. And this is a topic that comes up at the retreat almost every year, building some flexibility in the zoning ordinance. We steered away from the large footprint farm properties that are zoned R1A simply because if you do an overlay over that, it affects their ability to have insulation uh, for agricultural activity. If someone comes with a request on one of the larger blue parcels, that would have to be a rezoning as well. So we just didn't touch those. <coughs> Mr. Slade. I'll make a short three. It's a good idea. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cullen? I appreciate the idea, but I have not had a chance to review this at all. I like the idea, um, but I think we need to take it on a lot by lot basis. I think that's the idea, though, is it is on a lot by lot basis. Yeah, I, I think flexibility with um, uh, some rules that we have to abide by, and, and I think that's probably a good thing for our community. Mr. McCain. Uh, it's a great idea. It lets people uh, still have their home-based businesses. I like the historical aspect of it. Uh, looking at each house and saying, you know, we've got some historical high homes here in the downtown area that make sure that we don't you know, just demolish those type of buildings and take, you know, take care of that aspect. But, um, the purple. Is that the residential? I can't see the. The purple area was included. It's the back end of Ellerslie, right? And Ellerslie, the pub was done in 2007, 13 years ago. And Mr. Merkel has visited with the Planning Commission on several occasions over the years. Uh, he completed phase one of the project. Phase two and three expired. The pub literally expired. Um, so that parcel was included because there are, it's a fairly large vacant area on that, on that lot. Um, so it was included in the grid. Um, John and I discussed, and I've discussed uh, also with Jennifer No, um, Mark I don't know if Jennifer had a chance to catch you up, but the area of Ellerslie that's sort of developed, that's very compact, very tight, very small houses, that would not be included. It's just not appropriate, it's not sufficient parking. Uh, to absorb this kind of development within the small footprint of those lots. Uh, most of them are two tenths or below of an acre. So, but the purple area that's vacant um, would make an excellent choice, uh, should Mr. Merkel elect to do so, to do a blended commercial residential use. Um, I know the village is thriving in Pleasant View um, now that the economy has developed has picked up. And it's really created kind of a community within the community for that area. A pleasant view. And those businesses are now thriving. And the residents that live in the village are also feeding the quarter right there at the intersection of 41A and 49. But the new businesses that are located there. So the green is pretty much uh, commercially leaning. The tan or the brown is residential. But yes. all makes you R2, and we get a lot of requests from people who own single family houses as well. Uh, maybe they have a large house, but they have um, a cottage in business, so to speak. And we get a lot of requests from them um, for different ideas and concepts that they have. But I did want to just bring you a rezone or an expansion of the zoning district because, again, not every use is appropriate for everyone. So, Mr. Cullen, since you have not had time to uh, review this, um, would 
the Planning Commission like to postpone the recommendation on this until January? I think it's the perfect time to announce we don't have anything on the agenda for December. So would you like to postpone this to January? It's not necessary. I'll just not vote for the issue. Well, so, as you know, in your function as a planning commission, when something that is a district overlay is presented to you, is your recommending body to the city commission. Uh, the city commission has, for the past nine years that I'm aware of, um, really wanted to invest in an overlay for the downtown area to kind of create activity and economic development support for the downtown area. So it's at the pleasure of the planning commission whether you wish to make that recommendation tonight or withhold it until your next meeting. And the recommendation would be that those zones that's depicted on the number of the yes. And they will get a formalized parcel list along with the overlay district and additional use that's in your contract. Is this a you know, R3 pipe? And then this down below the left corner is an R1A. In R3, in purple, that is the cut for Ellerslie. Yeah. Uh, that cut kind of district, I will remark that map um, so that the occupied areas of that would not be a part of this. Yeah. So I will redraw that it would only be the parcels that are not the vacant, the vacant land area for phase two. And in the bottom left corner is a different shade of purple? I'm sorry. The yeah. bottom left corner is a different shade it of purple. It is R1A. Okay. So, only the houses are in the yellow. Just the yellow houses. I, I just have to ask this. This is Main Street right here? Yes, sir. Right. And this green here, is that this I2? It is actually that green area appears to be, says it's I2, but I don't think it is. Uh, Austin P recently updated their web platform, and I'm not quite sure that's accurate. It is all on the C1 downtown. This is supposed to be C1. Yes. And is that what you are saying would be allowable mixed use with residential upstairs and yes. commercial downstairs? Anywhere that is this color, these these areas right here. Yes. Okay. But that green up there, that is I2, correct? No, sir. That would not be. That's that would not also be on the story at all. What would that no, be? No, but that's I that is not yellow. Yeah. That's across the railroad track. That, 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 that is I2. That is I2. So yes, it appears to be the same color as this, but it should not be. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. I will, or John, if you could talk oh, to me, okay. we'll also be tomorrow, the colors uh, kind of change. The area downtown is C1. It should be that darker kind of blue green. Right. It looks like a mapping mistake. Um, okay. They've done it. And then I noticed this. I don't, I don't know why, but, but this is different. This is residential. It is, it's residential R2. If you think about along Main Street and across from Sky King and the commercial strip that's there in the Irish Marketplace, many of those buildings are occupied as businesses, but they're still zoned as R2. Uh, and I think that this does not change the base zoning of the lot. But it builds flexibility and an overlay for mixed use within this particular area. So as an example, right now across the street from commercial strip, there's a hair salon. But if that hair salon were to vacate, someone wanted to occupy it as a residential structure, and as long as it's a have a residential structure, they could. So we're not trying to eliminate uses, we're trying to overlay in a particular area downtown, flexibility in what the buildings and the locks can be used for. So, you know, I'm sorry for not getting that's, the that's fine. but when I see that, when I see the commercial with the, the sea green on Main Street, and then I see inserted in there the R2, um, and we're talking about future use, uh, what, why is it that we don't want that to be mixed use capable as well in the future? Well, I think that without making both sides of the street, you have a church there, you oh, have okay. residential okay. uses there, you have other okay. uses in that area. Okay. So true. if we rezone them and change the base zoning, then no residential occupation could occur. 
I got you. Okay. So okay. that's why okay. the overlay rather than changing the district though. So, um, does anybody else have any questions? So, we talked to somebody about changing the color of the zone. I'm sorry, we talked to somebody about changing the color of the zone. Um, we got like three shades of green, three shades of blue. Well, it drives me insane. Can't do that. Can't do that. What should we do? What is it? We got so, red. We got red. <laughs> John, if you'll give John some notes and some feedback, Pat Austin, can you? All of the math and presumption within the county is done by Austin Peay State University and their GIS center. And they did a recent update to the zoning platform for the entire county. And somehow the colors didn't quite, quite come back the way they should have. So John can make a call and we're correcting that, which would be done before it went to the city commission. Uh, but that does not truly reflect the color that we should have. <coughs> So are you asking this as a recommendation for them to consider, or are you, is this going to be considered, because this is a, will effectively be a change to the zoning ordinance, which of course has to be formally approved here and then up to the body. So do you anticipate to come back here for formal approval? Right now, the mapping portion of it will have to be corrected. What I'm asking you to recommend is the overall district. It doesn't contain any map and parcel. It's just the district. Okay, well, but that is effectively to be included now in the intent is for that to be included in the zoning ordinance. So that is a technical change to the zoning ordinance. Yes. So don't we need to formally put that down rather than just making a recommendation? So Martha Brooke is recommending that we correct the map before we make the recommendation. I, I think that we, if you discuss it now, we have just one part and parcel of the next meeting. You'll have your formal uh, approval of the change to the zoning ordinance and all that part and parcel, and then send it to your commission. Uh, rather than just making a simple recommendation that they consider this, I think it needs to actually be taken as a vote of a formal acceptance from you all of the change to the zoning ordinance. Kind of like when you do a rezone, you're effectively changing your zoning ordinance, so you go through the formal approval, then it goes up to the commission. So I think it would be cleaner for us to handle it in, in that respect. So Martha Burke is recommending we come back to you in January with a corrected map. So at this point, it's discussion only. Any other questions on this item? Thanks, Mr. President. Okay, moving on to the next item B, discussion of the map, 096 parcel 62 East East of Springs Road, concept of view and sketch plan. Okay, in your packet behind this ordinance, uh, we received a call um, from a development firm three weeks ago. Um, I responded to that it's, um, it's part of the Dillard investment property on um, East Kingston Springs Road. It is map 96, parcel 62. They have presented um, a concept review, and that is on the second page, and it's also on the wall. This is the parcel um, that is adjacent to the school. It contains a significant area of flood area. They are proposing uh, a number of units for development, as you can see laid out on the sketch plan. This is not a plan, it's a sketch plan. The only portion of the development as it's proposed that lies within the flood area is the road. And at in 2011, your flood ordinance was revised. And during the revision of that flood ordinance in 2011, when your subdivision regulations were then revised, the road is allowed to be placed in the flood area. So, the road would be, um, a portion of the road would lie within the flood area, but none of the lots for residential construction, and this is a proposed residential construction plan, would lie in the floodway. The purpose of this being on the agenda tonight is to get some feedback from you. And, uh, I don't know if the applicant. He's here. Uh, and he may have some comments for the planning commission and your pleasure. And in the road, you're talking about the upper left corner? Yes. Okay. So, my name is Richard, and I apologize. The road comes off of Kingston Springs here, and 
loops around the, these lines, um, the kind of squiggly line, you can see that's 500 year blood zone, but you don't regulate that at all. Just a portion of it flies within the 100 year flood line, which is this one. So a portion of the road right at the entrance to Kingston Springs. Is Harvard High School lie at the top of that? Yes. Okay. Is Harvard High School lie right against the border, yes. directly against that border? So the high school is only it's a matter of hundreds of feet. That's right. Yeah. The high school is located uh, in close proximity to this lot. This was the a portion of the property, part of it was secured by the Thornton's development. This is a portion that was left that was subdivided off of, of that property and left for sale. So again, everything is out of the regulated flood area with the exception of that portion of the road. I have spoken to the um, applicant and explained to him the uh, magnitude of flood that we had in 2010. Um, and also the complexities of traveling around these springs at the time uh, because of the warmth. So if you don't have any questions for me, then the outcome um, may be. My, my only other question, I'm just trying to make sure I have this the right piece of land. Uh, this is not the, the high ground up behind the summit, is it? No. Okay. This is down closer to the high school. As you look at, to orient you, Mr. Chairman, the McPherson property, right. as I'm traveling away from Kingston Springs, mm -hmm. it's not the parcel directly behind the sign, it's that next oh, yes. I think yes. there's the light. I assume there's the light there at that intersection. Okay. Right. And it should, it should be a road to the right. Okay. Well, I got you. Uh, Mr. Rimmick, that intersection, um, yeah, you can see the intersection further down, but the road has been shown as parts of the sign exists. That's within. Parcel. It's just Kingston Springs Road, right? Okay, that short time. So we're not recommending, we're just asking questions. Is that correct? Yes, this is just a concept. Mm -hmm. This is, I bring these to you from time to time. It's been a while since you've had them. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last one was on the lot next door, or somebody came in and proposed a number of apartment units in the corner of the street. And so, so we're going to use those so as an applicant and get some feedback. And so if somebody here is representing the applicant? Yes, we're working. Okay, yeah. sir. In, are you the engineer? Yes, uh, Brian Hamilton, National Civil. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, several weeks ago, I met a couple of guys on this property. We walked around. They were interested in it, so we talked about having some town homes and some single family lots. So, just a couple of days ago, my friend, Mr. Moss, purchased the property. So, we are very interested in and moving forward with this concept we wanted to present it to the county commission to get some feedback uh, no structure would be located within flood plain uh, in the flood plain of course we, there would be nothing happening in the flood plain the flood plain uh, no structure would be the uh, structure that would be close to the flood plain would be at least four feet above This is a, a very much just a sketch, but it's just the concept that we thought about with the with the uh, townhomes uh, along the property, the common property around there. We talked about a lot of you know recreation and maybe soccer fields, some type of in, other sports in the floodplain areas, uh, some walking trails. And things like that. There's two big arrows that um, there's a small little creek there, and uh, they're also interested in the property across that creek. So, and the the items numbered one through twenty, those are the town homes. Town homes. And the other items are single family lots. Is that what those are? Correct. Um, any questions for Mr. Hamilton? I'm still confused about the location of this. You have the at the light at the corner. There's a, a sign. Then you've got a piece of property with thought was part of the original development with Thornton's that that the Diller knows. Then beyond that, there was a property that we talked about a 
about three years ago that was for the potential low income housing environmental. That's this property. No, it's beyond that. Yes. So beyond that. That's it. Yeah. One down. <laughs> if you look at that, if you look at that top line, is just on the other side the road that goes behind Harper High School, the first yes. road you see. So right above that line, there's the road that you turn right and go around behind Harper High School. So that's how close it is. But it's right up against that road. All right, thank you. Basically, down at the bottom of the hill there. But the flood zone there that goes across that country road from Kingston Street Road is where the water is going across and so all the way to the houses. Where is that light at the uh, high school and the middle school? Just, just to the north of that there. You can see some paint arrows, all those lanes there. Those would be the turn lanes. Top left corner. At the very top of the drawing. That road really turns towards the middle oh, school that. right there. Oh, the top. Yeah, that, that hard to keep trails right there. Yeah. Uh, I also explained to the applicant the challenges of that intersection, um, particularly since TDOT's been directing rather large trucks. <laughs> that has stopped the bridge. They, they, they have stopped it. They, 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 all those wide loads were causing a nightmare on Kitchen Road. Well, yes, sir. Uh, then we also have a great deal of traffic that goes through there in the afternoons, people cutting through to get to Dixon uh, that comes through our downtown area. So I've discussed all of those. But this is not downtown. Though. This is not near downtown. What's Pardon? This does not interfere with downtown traffic. No, it will not go to downtown. No, we're just exit. exit. There is a lot of traffic on that area. Oh yes, there's, there's school loading and storage units with, uh, with with everything from the exit. And, and, and that's the thing. I guess that'd be my main concern with anything anything that goes on there is what, what's the traffic impact going to be uh, with our current exit issues that we're having anyway. Um, and, and, I also advised um, him that a traffic study for this particular location would be required because it does exit onto the state road and we would furnish the data that we have from the previous three traffic studies that were generated in the area as we did for every other applicant that came through. Um, and the data that's produced from the McPherson property and the Thornton's and Tell property would all be incorporated into traffic study that would be required to come to you. So those are kind of the challenges of the lot. Is the idea that these single family lots would be individual custom built or would it be like a development where you have a certain set of designs you're using? No designs as of yet. It's, it's still a concept that I would foresee, you know, craftsman style home. And also, I can foresee the backyards actually going into flood plain. You know, the, the structure being well out, all the road being out, etc. And the entrance, the reason why it's there, there's a large pipe that is on that property. And uh, there are some grading or, or slope challenges because of the creek. And the guardrails and widening of that road by T.I. So that really is the only entrance really for the property. Any other any questions for Mr. Bill? About one acre lots or they're never going to or single family one you have in our line. Yeah, those this is a concept. I, I, I think they could be one acre lots and maybe um, it was just more I wanted to put what we were thinking about on paper just to to get that concept there with the town on the town to get the yield. And the product, we were understanding that there's not that to offer around you know, town homes. There's a lot of town homes. So would this be a pod? Is it designing a part of a pod for this? Or? Would this have to be a pod? That particular 
parcel was not overlaid with a cut. It was a suggestion, but it was not one that was adop adopted. That is up to the discretion of the planning commission whether or not it's presented to you as a cut or not. So is it an R1? Is it an R1? You can require that it be submitted as a cut. Um, my recommendation on this particular piece of property is that as they develop their plan, they give some thought um, to what happens if there is a, a flood and if there's an alternate exit from this property um, that doesn't place an additional burden on emergency services to attract people from that response. Does this property go all the way to the Harbor River? It goes to the flood close to the no, uh, doesn't. This particular lot did not have a significant um, flooding issue. The flooding issue um, within the area came when the bridge came out on Kingston Springs Road. It was impossible to get to either end. So it's uh, something that the town in general needs to look at in the likelihood of end. Because as you develop the more impervious surfaces that you develop, the wider the saturation area will be. Was this property flooded in 2003? The road was. It did. Yes. Um, How high did it get versus the 100 year flood? Pardon? How high was the flood level versus the 100 year flood flood? The flood level at that elevation is something I've had to look up. I know we collected water marks in that area. Uh, it is just down the road from. Um, turn of middle school, the road that goes in front of the middle school, three structures were removed from their foundations. The farm farm. That's what so took out the road. The road is and that the road road off on of the road. sand. And if you remember from the photographs, and I will share those with the applicant and with the planning commission that comes back, we have a great series of photographs, some of them aerial, some of them on the ground, of what that model looked like. Um, once that bridge came out, so it literally boat traffic was the only way to get back to you for the first several days. It was six days before I could get to Kingston Springs. Yeah, in that case, where this is located, we're only going to there would have been no way out from the boat. <laughs> you were just As you were going to Mr. Cullen, I spent a fair amount of time, if you'll remember, with the Corps of Engineers after the flood. Um, that flood was a 148 year story. Well, I know that Turnbull Creek was up nine feet above the 100-year uh, flood line. It absolutely was. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of discussion after it. There was a big conference that was held um, late in the summer of that year. The Corps of Engineers held a big meeting downtown. Team up, a number of other entities and agencies came and attended that meeting. I went for all three days that it was there, um, so that I could assist residents here, you know, with getting through the process. And Mr. Rohrbach, um, who is the lead engineer, hydraulic engineer for the Port District at the time for Nashville, had remarked and run the calculations for the flood. It was a 148 year event. Um, it was not the amount of water, it's just the saturation level, and the rain off and on for two weeks. So it did it's, take a tremendous Didn't that branch flow backwards? Pardon? Didn't that branch flow backwards? It does. Yeah, it carried the house backwards. Yeah, it does. Right. It flows in a reverse plane. So it's um, that particular intersection, um, because of the collection of water from various directions, became a, a Pretty significant challenge for emergency services to provide assistance. So I heard something. So that intersection, the road to the right, is not just the entrance to the high school, it's actually a road. The road that they're referring to up there, there's a road that turns left and goes in front of the one way. Way. You're talking about the one that would go parallel to our front line. It's the exit of the high school. It is that's the high school driveway. It was all the way around the school. And but is it a road that yeah. goes around the school or is it the entrance to the high school? And it's it's part of the high school property. It's the road that takes traffic to the back of the high school. It's the high school in the road. Yeah. It's the drive. But just the school. Yeah. And then on the opposite side of the road is the middle school. 
And the area in front of the middle school is not in a mapped flood area. But the flood water took three structures completely off of their foundations, lifted the foundations out of the ground, and took out the bridge on Kingston Springs Road. All of that debris and saturation, then all of that puddle in the location where this property is from there. So there was virtually a lake, and then the Turnbull Creek area was just a nightmare. It's adjacent to this property. So that's the reason I advise you. This was a particular challenge. But the area where the houses were lifted are not, they were not in the map flood area. And it's in excess of 50% of the structures that flooded in Kingston Springs were not in a regulated map flood area. It never time. So our greenway where the houses were, I assume is at a lower elevation than this yes. property is. Okay. What if the BOE would be applicable to have a connected road right there in the middle of school somewhere so that let the kids walk to school and have emergency access to that? Well, I've also advised them that we have received some communication from the Corps of Engineers and from FEMA. If you'll remember, this planning commission received notification of new maps that were drawn in 2016. And the ordinance was adopted, and the new maps and new map panels were adopted in 2018. New data.